Hello, everyone. I'm joined today by Scott Johnson. Uh, we, we, we did a video a while ago, like a year ago or something like that, where we talked about collecting Star Wars more generally. And in that video, we touched a little bit on uh, this world of trading and gaming cards uh, within kind of the Star Wars Expanding Universe fandom. Uh, and we're here to talk more about collecting cards today, uh, talk about the fandom as it relates to these cards, uh, the collecting aspects, the high stakes tournament sides of these cards and everything in between. So thank you for joining me for this today. I'm excited to learn a bit more about the cards. That's like a big blind spot for me when it comes to the EU. I really know nothing about any of that. Well, thanks for having me, Brennan. It's a pleasure to be on and I enjoy talking about Star Wars cards, particularly the Decipher CCG game. I'm a big fan of that, not because I'm some expert player or anything like that. There's there's other YouTube channels that could delve into the details of competitive play in that. But uh, I think it's an important aspect of the history of the expanded universe. The game was developed, you know, during the Bantam era and takes a lot of the lore from West End games and some of the early anthology books like Tales from Mos Eisley Cantina, uh, Tales from Jabba's Palace and the licensing angle that when Decipher actually got the license for Star Wars, because they've they're they're a game company that produced card games for a number of franchises in the '90s. Uh, they had Lord of the Rings, they had Star Trek, and they were trying to compete against Magic: The Gathering. And they did this by acquiring licenses for IPs, people that were interested. Like they they knew that if they created a Star Wars game, people would want to pick it up, even if they didn't necessarily want to play it. The, the cards are just visually stunning uh and, and they had access to the behind the scenes tapes before they started to do the special edition the original movie reels and they could take a uh, screenshot almost pictures of the, those movie reels and kind of digitally enhance them and create cards for background characters that you didn't normally notice when you saw the film and they developed a lot of the lore they named a lot of the characters from a lot of those scenes and those names stick today all the way through the new canon. There's been expanded universe stories about some of them. And uh, it, it's just, it, it's an important aspect of the expanded universe that yes, the, the card game fans are normally we think as separate. They don't appear on some of these channels that do, for example, book reviews or things like that. But like the video games and the RPGs, the card games, are, are definitely an important uh, aspect of Star Wars and the EU. In regards to licensing and stuff like that, uh, like like you said, uh, these cards named like a lot of these characters that it would keep consistent. Uh, do you think that, uh, like for example, when when Kevin J. Anderson back in the day was writing for Bantam, would he, would he have been aware of the cards and what they'd done? Uh, is is there any contradiction in terms of names for the characters, or does it largely stay consistent and appear that like once Lucasfilm let them name some characters on these cards, uh, the authors had to take that into account and uh, you know at least be aware of these names for these characters. When the designers, uh, particularly from Decipher, and we, we can also touch on some of the other card games that appear later on everything was cataloged in, into the, I don't know if it was called the Holocron at that point, but I see interviews and there's interviews available on YouTube of some of the game designers. Uh, Chuck Collenbach is one of them. And he gives testimony to the fact that he worked with the people at Lucasfilm. I think it was, uh, it was Bill Smith at uh, West End Games. And yeah. uh, he, he dealt with Kevin J. Anderson with the anthology books. And and even Leland Chi at that point, he, he remembers Leland Chi by name and crazy. Uh, and uh, just talking with him and say, you know, is it okay if we use this character? And he's like, yeah, yeah, we got it in the da database. And and Lucasfilm really took a proactive approach of ensuring that everything that was being created and and these these crossovers between the books and the the RPGs and the card games, everything was uniform and. The, there may have been a few minor contradictions, but but nothing I've been able to notice so far. And uh, they've really done a good job with that. In fact, Lucasfilm 
uh, I think Leland Chi said, yeah, you're actually doing us a favor by naming some of these characters because we, we'd like to do action figures at some point for some of these background characters because we've made essentially all the action figures for the main characters. But for people that want to fill in the background of like the Cantina or Jabba's Palace or, or Cloud City or something like that, we, we want these characters to have a name so we can trademark them and, and just sell products around them. Yeah, that's that's so so cool. I just I just absolutely love that. I've I've seen online like screenshots of cards for like even like the holiday special characters as well. Like some of those background characters, absolutely mind blowing to me that they were able to do that. And for for people who talk about like how Lucasfilm never cared about the expanding universe and stuff like that, why why go to the trouble of like maintaining this database that kept everything consistent, that kept the continuity even to card card games like i i I just think that's mind-blowing that they cared uh, enough to make sure that everything lined up yeah and it was difficult because their main focus particularly at decipher later at wizards of the coast they're creating a card game right Mm -hmm. and that product needs to stand on its own it's not enough to just make sure it's consistent with the star wars universe you have to make it fun to play you have to capture the feel of Star Wars. I know that's a trope everybody kind of throws around. Oh, it doesn't feel like Star Wars. But really, the Decipher CCG, everybody mentions it was an early card game. It was clunky. They didn't have a lot of the details hammered out yet at that point. But it almost feels like, and I'm not familiar with the uh, the RPGs, but it feels like an RPG to play because there's an aspect where, where you as a player actually contribute a force one point per turn. And uh, it's based on locations. So each location will generate force on their own that they deploy for um, when you deploy them to the table. So they'll have light side, uh, lightsaber icons. So it's blue lightsaber icons for the light side. And then your opponent, or if you're a dark side, you have a light side opponent as red lightsabers. And that gives you money to play the game with, so to deploy characters, to draw cards. And uh, the, the location aspect is, is like mana in magic the gathering if anyone's familiar with that um and and that that's uh took some s- some adjustment to get that going because th- at the beginning there was no real way to get the locations out of your deck by the time special edition rolled around which was like version 2.0 of the game uh i forget if it's like the sixth six sixth or seventh set or something like that they came out with objective cards and that really streamlined the game and i, I think improved it tremendously that those objective cards allowed you to start with many locations rather than one. So a normal uh, start to a decipher card game, you deploy any location as your starting location you want. But these objectives allowed multiple cards, multiple effects, and locations in play at the start of the game. Kept it, uh, got it rolling a little bit better. So how many updates were there overall for uh, the game? There, there's a special edition. It's like a 2.0. How many more past that were there? I, I, I heard that there's like fan continuations and like fan updates uh, like online and stuff like that. But how many like official uh, updates to the card game were there? Yeah, there, there's a variety of formats you can play the Decipher Star Wars CCG in. Uh, there's virtual sets now. So the game was actually in print from 1995 to 2001. And that was all the way up through the uh, episode one sets. At that point, so they, they utilized the... phantom lore in the cards. Yes, yes. There, wa- there wasn't as much for the Phantom Menace because at that point, they they when they created that movie they they basically had names for everybody at, from the get go because they knew how big it was going to be and they they wanted to sell product right away so right. that one was a, a little bit different but basically there there's two or three sets for each film so premiere the the, the first set is premiere and it has like three hundred twenty four cards something like that um, and, and then there's a, a second set a new hope so those those two uh, those two expansions basically take up the first movie. From there, you go to Hoth, which is the third set. Uh, then there's Dagobah and Cloud City. So there's really three more for Empire Strikes Back. Then they went to Jabba's Palace. And then they came out with Special Edition. But by that point, you uh, they got to 90, 1997. They, that coincide with the release of the Special Edition. 
Uh, so that was like Premiere 2.0, if you will. And then there was two more sets for Return of the Jedi, which was Endor and Death Star 2. So those sets make up a, a format that's pretty popular because that brought you up to the year 2000. And by that point, Pokemon and some other games kind of started getting going. Uh, so some people dropped off. There, there were sets after that, but um, the writing was on the wall that they were going to lose the license by that point. Uh, they, they have sort of a similar scenario to West End Games. I don't know if people are familiar with the licensing with that, but uh, basically with West End Games, they, they had the license for RPGs and there was a parent company that produced women's shoes or something like that and so <laughs> of, of, of all things and they mismanaged funds from that aspect of the business and because of that they had trouble with west end games and because they were going through financial difficulties uh lucasfilm didn't want to continue the the renewal for the license for that for for a company that was dealing with those problems uh on, on on decipher's uh angle the the story is similar but they had actual financial fraud in in their financial department i think uh, the ceo's brother-in-law or something was cooking the books and uh stealing money and i think he eventually went to jail about seven years later it, it took wow. to like 2008 and he, he had a six-year jail sentence but decipher is still in business uh i think they just create party games now they don't actually have license but uh after they dropped star wars uh, just an interesting point. They created their own card game called Wars. It was, a, it was a terrible title because if you search for it on eBay, if you search Wars card game, you're going to get Star Wars. You're going to get everything under the sun. Uh, but this is, is it fantasy. It looks kind of more fantasy inspired, or is it? Is yeah, it's it's, it's kind of like Star Trek, but on a on a smaller angle. Um, okay. There there's RPGs for this. There's short stories. I I think there might be novels too. Oh, so. Wow. It was Michael Stackpole that created the background for, for Decipher's War franchise. Uh, and they were familiar with, with Stackpole because Stackpole was so influential in, in Star Wars. They used a lot of the lore and they, they were bouncing ideas off of him. So uh, that, that was really cool. And an, another aspect is Nathan P. Butler, who has a uh, longtime Star Wars podcaster, Star Wars timeliner. And he wrote a short story, Equals and Opposites, uh, or not a short story, a comic. Uh, and he, Tales. yeah, he wrote a couple novellas for Wars as well. Wow. So th those, it's full of Star Wars authors, uh, as, as far as like Wars, lore, Wars, uh, media. Are, are you acquainted with the continuity to that world? Is, is it, does, does it feel somewhat Star Wars inspired having all these Star Wars minds in there? So they, they have Earth. It, it basically takes place in our solar system, I believe in the future. And, there's a couple different angles. There's like, uh, you know, there's a human faction and, and some alien factions. And uh, there's one based on Mars and one based on Venus or some of the moons of Jupiter or something. And uh, b basically the, the game works a lot like the Decipher Star Wars game, but but cleaned up. I mean, this fits right in. Like it, it has destiny numbers. It has uh, power, ability you know, forfeit, uh, deploy costs. It, it works very similar to Star Wars. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't go very long, probably because it wasn't named very well. <laughs> um, but but the factions are actually on there and they're color coded. So it's Earther, uh, Gongan, Maverick, She, and Quay. Those are the, mm -hmm. the factions you can play against. I'm not sure how it works as far as deck construction, whether you can have like multiple, but the, the locations, the deploy, the, the way the game works is very similar to Star Wars. So it all built off of the Star Wars card game they'd done, but kind of just improved it uh, overall, right. polished yeah. it up. Could could you then, with the Star Wars card game, implement some of the ideas or rules, uh, like the fans could implement some of the rules or ideas that Wars introduced to the table to improve the Star Wars card game? Yeah, and, and there are some fan projects in the Star Wars card game community of, of revamping the game creating their own versions of cards so that this is all aside from the virtual sets that are official sets for tournament play that the players committee makes but there's a couple of youtube channels i know there's a guy called fatty f-a-t-t-y on youtube he has some hilarious like star wars videos he has a, a one or two hour discussion just on jar jar binks and he has a 
binder just full of Jar Jar Banks cards, and he has something to say about every single one. I don't know how he does it, but it, that that video is so hilarious. And uh, he he mentions, you know, he participates in some of the retro format tournaments that they have online there, and and I think he went to one or two uh, live tournaments as well. But he was working on a project that he mentioned uh, is to basically rewrite the game in a more updated, streamlined, less clunky version. Uh, and that takes a lot of work. I mean, you're, you're basically doing what a multi-million dollar company did, you know, several decades ago. So uh, it, it's hard to do. I, I think it takes a lot of people. But uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, contact him. <laughs> he'll, he'll point you in the right direction. So as you've alluded to, there's there's a very hardcore, very uh, supportive uh, fan base around these these cards, then around this community that's just continued. Um, what's the uh, crossover like uh, in those circles to like more general expanding universe circles? Yeah, well, you mentioned why it's popular. Let, let me touch on that first. It's uh, it, it really started going back. Uh, there, there was YouTube videos about it uh, starting around the, the pandemic around 2020, where people were kind of going through what they had in their closet and they pulled out this, this star Wars game. And some say there's something about the rule of, of 20, like 20 years later, uh, something will be popular again, like Ugg boots for some reason is like, that's a thing now again. And, yeah. and Star Wars it was kind of similar. It, like everybody shelved it for about 20 years. And, you know, after uh, 2001, come 2021, uh, they're, they're starting to, to get interested again. again. So as, as far as crossover is, a lot of the people that were interested in Star Wars back then were, of course, Expanded Universe fans because that was how star Wars continued at that point, people had to read the books because they had no other alternative. There was no more films. There was no more um, TV shows or anything like that. So there, there is a crossover angle, but it's not to the point where these people watch star Wars, EU book reviews, uh, you, you know, YouTube videos or, or, or in any discord or anything. They, they have their own section where they're, uh, they're just fans of the card game and there's so much to the card game that takes up a lot of their time, but they remember things like tales from most Eisley Cantina tales from Jabba's palace shadows of the empire. They're all familiar with that is similar to how RPG players are where they're, they're focused on playing RPG scenarios. They know some of the expanded universe stuff, but that doesn't take up their, their day-to-day -day activities. It's, it's something that they, you know, they, they find, they have fond memories of, they're, they're somewhat knowledgeable of, but they're not, that's not their mainstream interest. Yeah. They're, they're acquainted with it, but it's, uh, they're, they're there for the cards now, uh, kind of, kind of the inverse of that. Uh, what, what do the cards add for people who are expanding universe fans who might not be interested in getting into, uh, tournament related stuff with the cards, with uh, the cards there, what, what do they add that's, you know, loot, new to the lore, uh, new continuity that would be worthy of exploring a bit for a more uh, expanding universe focused fan who's maybe not interested in uh, playing the game, but uh, is interested in what they have to offer? Yeah, well, I would point to the articles I wrote for the expanding universe dot com 2021 2022. Uh, and from there, I basically wrote those articles from the for, from the game's perspective uh, for a, uh, an expanded universe fan. And I, I touched on some of the, the characters that were created by the game and, and some of the ships that were impactful to the expanded universe and uh, so, some of the artwork as well. So uh, Shannon McRandall, who was the impersonation of Mara Jade for the game, she, she yeah. came through decipher uh, and, and they had a, uh, they had an open, audition if you will for anyone who might look like Mara Jade want to act that act that character for any uh figures that may come out action figures that come out for her for someone that would impersonate Mara Jade as, uh, officially at a convention and uh they made cards of her they took photos of her that that are in multiple games not just the decipher game but the wizards of the coast game as well mm -hmm. and uh th that's important it also Michael Stackpole and Timothy Zahn were also photographed and have cards in the game 
Uh, so that's that's kind of cool. But as far as like new yeah. expanded universe lore, there's not really that much on it. It's, it's more that the game created certain certain names and, and certain locations. There, there are a couple things that the game uh, created that actually the expanded universe did, never went anywhere with, like like Tempest Force with um, the the uh, Imperial uh, Legion that's on Endor during Return of the Jedi. They, they created some of the background on that. The Emperor's Demonstration Team. There, there's some lore that there's nothing else from the expanded universe uh, beyond the cards. It's beyond the cards, right? It's just it's just in the lore of the cards. That's uh, really cool, but, though. But certain characters like Captain Sarkley. I think he was in one of the later Rogue Squadron games for GameCube. Uh, okay. he, he appears there. there there's uh, the Imperial advisors that aren't named anywhere else, but they're named in the in the card game. Uh, Janice Grajadis and forget the other guys. Similu, Similu is the other guy. Yeah. Uh, so that 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 sort of thing, and it, it's kind of cool to have some of these expanded universe characters in their card, you know, form, just like you would purchase an action figure, right? Yeah. Sa same thing, and, and not just the Decipher game, but also like the Tops trading card license. There's no game attached to that. But there's images of expanded universe scenes, characters, ships that those are the uh, purple cards, right? Like purple, like a uh, uh, cut out around the cards. Um, uh, I yeah, think. I, I, th I think some of them, uh, some of the more modern cards have uh, have purple bordering. But there, there were several sets. I, I think they're at like set fourteen now with Star Wars, and there's probably a ton of glare on these. But you see. Uh, here's Anakin Solo. I think Max so cool. Maxine uh, strictly Star Wars showed off some of these. Yeah, Jason Solo. These are front and back, and these have texture to them. There's Jaina Solo, um, and there's several sets of these. Like the first three really have the main EU material, yeah. and I think then they, they they shelved Star Wars for a while. While the prequels were going on, they ramped back up with Top Series Four. And there's some EU stuff here and there, but not as much as the first three sets. So I would recommend the first three sets to any EU fan. Super, super cool. And that's like original art commissioned for the cards, right? So um, that, that, that's just really, really neat uh, that we have uh, these visual art pieces uh, from from a source like cards. It, it can give us insights into the characters, into where they are and stuff like that. Uh, just visually, they're in the world. It's nice to have more art pieces because with with you know books and stuff you're you're picturing most of everything. So so it's it's nice to have is a wide array of art just to have that visualized. I feel like so it's it's a neat it's a neat way that we can get more of that. Uh, with 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 the trading cards, there's no game attached. Uh, so so there, it's just there's there's nothing new, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing new to anything like that. Whereas. Uh, something that has a game attached is going to have to create rules and stuff like that, et cetera, et cetera. So is there, there's more meat on the bone to the, to the uh, stuff from decipher, right? I, I think so. Just due to the popularity of the mm -hmm. decipher game and also the wizards of the coast, like sealed product for these games is ridiculously expensive. Um, good luck trying to buy some of that because, because I can't afford it. Uh, but it, there, there's there's many different aspects to it. There, there's people interested in graded cards specifically. Uh, there's people interested in autographs. So mm -hmm. for the Decipher game, there's people that collect the cards just for the visual aspect and yeah. autograph them or or um, you know grade them and 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 put them on slabs or or, or just collect sealed product. There, there's so much. It, it, people track the state of the market and that and that's its own fandom entirely like <laughs> you could really get into the minute details and have no idea if anybody is familiar or interested in any of this but you, you'd be surprised there's there's a lot of interest in that sort of thing uh particularly because there, there's no more product going to be printed right uh this is sort of something that's over and done with and there was a lot of product printed so you can get your hands on uh particularly unsealed product if you're interested in it for for a decent price so it's it's not unobtainable but there's a lot of things that you could collect if you wanted to. Uh, one of the things when Decipher lost the license, they had a lot of uncut sheets. And these are poster sized, basically all the cards put together that are uncut. And there's hollow versions of them. There's uh, sheets that so of cool. just all rare cards. 
and there's there's promo materials associated with this for for all the expansions there's a lot of things to collect i think there's a collector's guide on the star wars uh players committee website and it's year by year of what was released and what people have and so, some of those un uncut sheets for years they, they were like 20 bucks on eBay, but now ever since 2020, people are more interested in them. And if you have the room to display such a thing, they look really nice. They're, they're amazing. There, there was some uh, talk in one of the groups, whether people were actually cutting the rare sheets to get some of the cards that themselves, because uh, some of the ultra rares, for example, are $300. You know, it's like, would, would you, would you risk trying to cut those? But I think that the uncut sheets themselves have so much value that it, isn't worthwhile to do that. Yeah. So there's a lot of avenues here. Uh, th these aren't people who are even interested at all in playing the games. They just, they just want to get these cards in various formats. Uh, and uh, how, how prevalent are signatures on these cards? Like uh, a lot of people taking these around to conventions back in the day. So there's quite a few uh, that you can find with signatures and uh, how much does that raise the value to them? Uh, it, it does raise the value. People are looking for specific autographs, um, depending upon what you like. It, it's probably impossible to collect all of them, but there were some promo materials that were oversized cards, basically, of Leia in her slave outfit, I guess that was really popular, or uh, the, the, the Mara Jade card, or um, the, the one that's in the cantina. It's actually based on the Watcher Step objective with uh My michael stackpole and, and kevin j and or not kevin j anderson it's uh timothy's on T and timothy's on in the cantina it dressed up in costume so so tim zon was the yeah. uh talent talent card character and uh uh corin stackpole horn, was corin. Yes, yeah. stackpole was corin exactly so cool and uh something you mentioned earlier is we we have the cipher we have the cards to thank for our, our, our live action uh, depiction of Mara? That, that's right. I mean, to this day, she is active, you know, as a fan base and has stuck up for the expanded universe fandom on multiple yeah. occasions. So I, I think she's been a great ambassador for mm. our group. And, uh, you know, I, I, it, it would be awesome to, to get to meet her again at a fu future convention because she was at Celebration 1 and 2, I think. Mm -hmm. And she does some independent conventions, but she hasn't really been invited back to the mainstream. And I think she just has such an important history uh, that, that she would be a, a hit no matter where she goes uh, as far as conventions go. When you saw her, did you get some cards signed or get some books signed or something like that? Anything like that? I, I didn't get a chance to meet her yet. Oh, no. okay, okay. She, she, she does have a way that you can contact her and send her stuff to send have it signed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she'll sign basically anything with Mara Jade, yeah. you know, the union comic, uh, people send her allegiance and choices of one, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so she's willing to do it, but, but meeting her in person is, is another thing. It'd be cool to do that. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's just so cool that that is the source to where we got like, the closest in my mind, you know, the closest we'll get to Mara Jade in live action in a movie or television series or something is the is the modeling that she did for Mara Jade. And it's it's really cool that that was the avenue to where we got that. Um, some so we, we talked a bit about some of the the lore that the card game established that uh, they didn't they didn't take it anywhere that you didn't run with it further. Uh, like you said, a a, a group of Imperials on Endor, for example, uh, is this lore, uh, would it be considered kind of S canon, like video games or like, uh, RPG stuff or, or, or is it like pretty firmly in canon? There's nothing to, nothing to suggest it would be diminished. Uh, according to the way the licensing worked, I think they cataloged everything in the Holocron or what became the Holocron later on. So it would, seem odd to me that they added some stuff from the game and not others hmm. that j just wouldn't make any sense but to go back to um the, the mara jade angle when they created the um the, the cards for some of these expanded universe characters and the expanded universe ships decipher's art department had to come up with some of the bounty hunter ships for example and this was around the time 
Shadows of the Empire was coming out. Okay. They had they had templates, of course, from um, so the, the Slave One Boba Fett ship from the movie because that actually appears there. And I think Bosk, uh, his ship, the Hound's Tooth, was also in one of those early either the West End Games guides or one of those early uh, essential guide to vehicles and vessels, something like that. But for the other bounty hunter ships, IG two thousand, IG eighty eight ship, I think that was a pro- product of sh- the Shadows of the Empire design team. But the Mist Hunter and I forget what the other one, the pu- Punishing one, the, mm-hmm. the other two bounty hunter ships were created by Decipher's art department. Uh, so they they have a hand in in creating a lot of this. And uh, when they had to do things like Shadows of the Empire. Um, like the Prince Shizor card and the, the, the Virago, the um, but one of the bosses for the, the uh, crime syndicate, the, the Black yeah. Sun crime syndicate, they, uh, they had to do makeup on a lot of these characters. And Shannon McRandall helped with the makeup on a lot of those photo shoots. Put the yeah, blue on, on the Thrawn character, things like that. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's really, really neat. Uh, with 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 all of the resources that these the card game was spending on this, uh, it, it seems like it was pretty high budget. It seems like a lot went into the cards from all angles, like art, photo shoots, uh, having to make a game, uh, uh, all the rules and stuff, uh, ha- having to check it over with uh, people at Lucasfilm. Uh, so was it was it a relatively like high budget uh, going into this card game? I I don't know anything about like. The market for cards, like how much they spend on them, how much they make, uh, was was it financially successful? Seemingly, uh, and yes. did they sink a lot of money into it? Very much so. So options were limited as far as entertainment in the 1990s. I mean, it was a whole different layout and right. and, and groundwork there. Um, but for, from <clears throat> some of the testimony, for for example, Chuck Hollenbach, from the time he got on to Decipher's team, because he started out as a play tester. And he was eventually hired by the company. That's how they typically handled uh, card games back then. I, funny enough, they don't do that now. Like they don't uh, hire the best Pokemon players for the Pokemon games or anything like that. But uh, that's the way things were done back then. And I think he started working on either Dagobah or Cloud City, if I remember right. And just in the time he was there, he said they sold $100 million worth of product. Wow. And, th- and th- that's wholesale. I'm, I'm guessing. So it, it, you just imagine like the, the warehouses of cards, it, it just the amount of product. I mean, I look at the bottom of a, of a booster box of one of these uh, expansions and the count is in the hundreds of thousands of millions in, in, in some cases. So there was wow. just a tremendous amount of product out there. Not all of it was sold. Obviously there were, there was some liquidated after they lost the license, but uh I think it was tremendously successful and a lot of money was made. What would the marketing have looked like uh, for getting, for getting it out there back in the day? W- w- was that, was there marketing for that in like old comic advertisements and stuff like that? I, I don't remember seeing it, but uh, where, where were they spreading the word to star Wars fans that there was this uh, collectible card game out there? Yeah, it was in a lot of the magazines, star Wars insider, uh, I'm not sure if it was in Star Wars Galaxies, but it's in Star Wars Gamer, which which is curious because that was made by Wizards, Wizards of, the Coast, of the Coast, and that was a competitor, right? <laughs> that was who picked up the license yeah. after after Decipher lost it. Yet there's plenty of deck lists in Star Wars Gamer uh, for, <laughs> for the Decipher card game that was, you know, either winding down or or they had you know lost it entirely because there there was some lead time with some of these sets as far as mm-hmm. like. Uh, I think it was 2002 where Wizards of the Coast released the TCG set. So where Decipher left off with episode one, Wizards of the Coast started with episode two. Okay. Around the release of the film. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there was there's plenty of promo material. There's posters. Uh, this was sold in game stores. I remember because back then as a kid, I was just a sports card fan. But I remember specifically uh, the Star Wars game being sold at places like Toys R Us, Target walmart mm-hmm. things like that it was out and about you could find it pretty easily yeah yeah pretty pretty much a- anywhere and I, I really regret not buying some of this stuff especially when decipher lost the license and they had all this extra product that was liquidated um and it was going I, pretty cheap during that time probably 
it's it's hard hard to say because back then I, I didn't have a lot of money. I, I didn't I, I just missed the point. I wasn't quite like 14, 15 and started to work yet. So I, I wasn't earning money. But I, I remember uh, it wasn't cheap right away. Uh, the sets like Endor, I remember back around 2004, uh, were, were about $300. And that, that was a lot of money. You, even yeah. if you have a job at like a grocery store or something, I mean, you're not going to spend all your money on that. You're looking to buy a car. You're looking to buy other things. Yeah. And uh, particularly with the episode one sets, I think uh, Matt Wilkins talks about how he worked at a game store around that time. And he says, oh, man, I, I should have bought that product because that's that's super, super expensive. Now, he has no interest in, in card games, but the episode one sets, particularly Reflections 3, Reflections 2, Coruscant or Coruscant and um, and Theed Palace. Those are the those are the money sets. Like if you have that sealed, or or even unsealed, just individual packs and e even the cards from the packs, that's where the money is in this game. Interesting. So was was uh, Decipher's Star Wars card game the first uh, uh, release date wise card game uh, or or any kind of collector card for Star Wars to come out? Was there anything that predated it, or is it really was it the first mainstream thing or was it like truly like the first Star Wars card game? Uh, it was the first Star Wars card game. I'm not sure when Tops first started. Um, I would guess around 1995 or six. So probably shortly after, if I were to guess. Um, but since then, there's been several games. Like I said, Wizards of the Coast took the game from 2002 up until around 2006 2007 uh so they kind of went in a, a weird order they went and released the episode two stuff around the time the episode two movie was in theaters then they went for the classic trilogy so a new hope there, there were several sets for the original trilogy a new hope they had a scoundrel set they had a bounty hunter set uh they had empire strikes back and uh and return of the jedi and there were might have been uh, Shadows of the Empire said, I, I forget. But then they went back to uh, episode three. By, the, by that time, it was 2005, and episode three was released in theaters. And then they did one set for episode one, and that was it. And then they lost the license to, I believe it was Fantasy Flight. So okay. they came out with a game. There, there was a couple other card games. There was a uh, a pocket model set that was both cards and miniatures that was made by WizKids. And... Uh, that, that game, I, I don't really know how it works. I, I know I built some of the miniature models and they have expansions for things like the Force Unleashed and um, and some of the Shadows of the Empire stuff. Uh, but I don't know how the card game works. And uh, there, there was a Clone Wars set, Clone Wars Adventures by Topps. Uh, so Topps had the trading card license, but this is a trading card game. Uh, and this was based on one of the online card The MMO game. game yeah yeah so um they had that and then they uh once fantasy flight got the license they came out with the lcg which spencer Crilly has done articles for that on the expanded universe website i don't yeah. know as much about it but that game is entirely expanded universe based and then when new canon came around fantasy flight still had the license they created a dice game called star wars destiny Mm. And, and that uh, has a dice feature for every card. And it's very hard to uh, have space for that because not only do you need boxes of cards, you need boxes to keep the dice in. And <laughs> it's new canon. So who wants to play that anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then they, they're coming out with a new game. Pre-releases are actually uh, today, the date we're recording this, for Star Wars Unlimited. And uh, I have an article pending for the expandeduniverse.com on why I'm not playing Star Wars Destin or Star Wars Unlimited and what they could do to change the game to convince me to play. So that should be coming out. Uh, I, I think Matt scheduled it for release day, which is March 8th. Okay. Definitely be one to look for. Um, in regards to uh, kind of all of these card games, uh, it sounds like uh, the handoff from Decipher to Wizards of the Coast was right like mid movie trilogy. We did Phantom, you start with Attack of the Clones, but it's a different game. Uh, did, did some of the fans of the Decipher card game like jump over and toy around with Wizards of the Coast, or are those circles kind of different? Uh, it sounds like the fan base around Decipher is still super strong, uh, 
probably there isn't anything as strong around Wizards of the Coast's card game. Um, maybe I'm mistaken though. Just it, it is it, it isn't as strong. There there is a following to a lesser extent. Sealed product for that game is still tremendously expensive. The thing is, it doesn't really have a player base. It's it's more of a collector's base, and there is a virtual aspect where they have created expansions that were entirely expanded universe sets. So whereas the Decipher game, the players' committee had. Uh, turn some of their virtual sets towards the new canon, the new TV shows. The TCG by Wizards of the Coast had kept their game entirely expanded universe, as far as nice. I can tell. Uh, but the thing is, they don't have the website to actually play a rule a rules enforced game online. And th there's just very few videos in general about how to play the Wizards of the Coast game. Uh, there, there's one from Team Covenant. If you if you search on YouTube, Team Covenant, uh, they have they play a lot of their Star Wars games, and they're a former competitive uh, team of the Wizards of the Coast TCG game. They they played in official tournaments, a lot of the uh, conventions nice. and stuff had had tournaments, so they attended those. And, and they do have a video series on that game and how to play. Uh, but they're, as far as I could tell, one of the few. So it's very hard to find information about that game. And even though I picked it up at the start, I, I wasn't a big fan of like episode two. Because <laughs> yeah, at the beginning, it, they released the, the first set was episode two. And you're, you're stuck playing episode two characters. So who wants to do that, right? <laughs> it's like um, the, the game's a little different too, to where they have three arenas. So they have a... a personnel character arena uh, a starship space arena and then a ground arena and there's some interactions between them like for okay. example when they when they released the original trilogy cards they created a death star card that was deployed to the space arena but could fire and destroy stuff on the ground destroy Makes planets, sense. planets yeah. technically so th there was a, there was a little bit of that but uh b because you had the whole aspect to where they had to switch from the prequel trilogy to the classic trilogy. You had, you know, Jar Jar Binks and Luke Skywalker on the same side deployed at the same time. I was like, that's just lore breaking. Uh, I'm, I'm very particular. Dreams. Right. I, I'm very particular about my games in that they have to follow the the, the rules of Star Wars, the eras. At least of Star the era. Wars. Yeah. 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 It, and, and characters from the same faction have to fight on the same side it, it has to feel like star wars that's what I, i'm talking about when it feels like star wars it's gotta it's gotta be uh something that you'd actually see play out either on the screen or in a book so, something that could be possible so the differences then between decipher and wizards of the coast are pretty big was wizards of the coast as stingy with the art for their cards as they were with the art in their source books um i think sometime toward the end of Wizards of the Coast, they they switched from the movie images, like the official stills from the movies, to more of an art based format. So drawings, paintings, things like that. Um, some so people that's like where that. The art budget was that was missing from their source books. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, some people like original artwork, and some people like the original images. I, I think you have to have a mix of both, right? Because uh, by the time fantasy flight games comes around their miniature games their rpgs it's all original artwork and and some of it isn't very good right so it, it's got to be good artwork if it's original if not stick to the uh the movie stills but obviously you're limited in that and you, you don't have characters that are original you, you just don't have footage of that so you need original artwork for, for to some extent, but it, it's got to be good. And um, I think Fantasy Flight mix, missed the mark a little bit there. There, there. There's a mix of both in in the uh, in the Wizards of the Coast stuff. So, did the Fantasy Flight game stuff uh, was it more comparable to Decipher, more comparable to Wizards of the Coast, or was it really like sort of blazing its own trail, its own thing? It was its own thing. I, I think a lot of the um, former Decipher players didn't really care for it. I don't think it sold nearly as well because um, Wizards of the Coast was trying to do a lot of things at the same time. They had their foot in a lot of different arenas. So Star Wars, I don't think, took center stage. It wasn't a priority for them. Um, the, the cards look good. I think they have a lot of artwork. They, they use some of like the, the Mara Jade uh, photo shoot uh, that, that weren't used for the Decipher game were used for the Wizards That's of cool. the Coast game. So uh, I think there is some collectability to that, uh, but the game isn't as good in my opinion. 
Okay. That's that's very interesting. So uh, they didn't seem to the, – the people who had followed Decipher just didn't seem to take to the newer stuff as much uh, right. that was coming out. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, Decipher, when they were wrapping up around 2001, they had a game called Young Jedi. Uh, so this was meant for younger kids, and it just deals with Episode One stuff. Um, it's It's a little bit of a simpler game to play. There's rules in how to create a deck, so it's it's more streamlined. Uh, you, you can't just use whatever you want to do, but uh, it, it's almost sort of a rock paper scissors. It's very similar to the the Star Wars Adventures uh, or Clone Wars Adventures game, um, but this is like a straight rock paper scissors game. Like they're, there's they're color coded, and one color beats another. This, this game, there's three planets. There's Tatooine. There's Naboo. There's Coruscant. And uh, based on the the card, so if you have, for example, an Anakin version of a course stunt version of Anakin, he's going to beat any Tatooine card pretty much because mm -hmm. if you're playing on Coruscant, they they have an advantage, and you have to have gotcha. a mix of cards from each of the planets in your deck so that it's it's balanced and nobody gets wiped out. That's super cool. I I love that idea for playing. A game that way uh have, have you given it a try or uh just just read about uh how to play that one yeah i i brought it to my game store i, I put together a couple uh simple decks as, as far as i could make it with the cards i have i i haven't w went out to buy young jedi cards specifically most of the stuff i get is part of collections that i buy of decipher cards uh but i have enough to where i could i think create competitive decks and I, I uh, had some of my friends that play other card games that are familiar with how a, how a card game works and, and could play, you know, somewhat competitively. Uh, you know, they played against me. They, they say it's all right. But it, again, it was designed for kids. So uh, it, it's pretty simple in, on that, in that aspect. How um, easy to get into, would you say, would be for people looking to expanding universe fans who are interested first maybe in the collecting or lore uh, to these card games, but then eventually they want to try their hand at it. How accessible, how how easy is it, uh, or how much of a learning curve might it be to get into it? I, I imagine like if uh, an EU fan has like some RPG backgrounds, it might be like an easier transfer because, you know, RPG has some, you know, similar kind of rules, similar kind of style of play, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, in some regards. So like what's the learning curve for an EU fan who might be wanting to get into like playing maybe at an amateur level, maybe one day looking to go to tournament level stuff. Uh, what would that be like? Uh, as far as a beginning, uh, just getting in from the beginning, it's very hard to do. And I, I've been telling some of the people that, that run the players committee that they need to make it more accessible to new players. <laughs> there, there is something that they have for what they call uh, new and returning players. But I think even that level is too high. And, uh, <laughs> The, the people that are are playing, for example, on GIMP, which is the rules enforce version of the game that you can play online. So it has a it catalogs all the cards. You can create a deck with any of those cards, even the virtual cards, uh, and then play against an opponent online. There, there's always people playing, testing out stuff for tournaments and whatnot. The level of play on that is so high that it's just it isn't fun. And as a new player, you you can put in and say, you know, I, I'm a new player, and somebody might be patient with you uh, to to kind of help you out and play it play a uh, a game that's not on a competitive level. That's that's more for fun, uh, but but it's harder to find those sorts of people. Um, around the time COVID, you know, 2020, people were kind of interested and, and there was a lot of new and returning players at that time. So it was a little bit easier at that point, but now you just got to find somebody that's, that's going to work with you. And, uh, I, I've Some been trying a to lot find of patience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm in that boat myself. Like I've been trying to find, uh, somebody that, that would be able to, uh, to play the game at, at just a fun level because i don't have a lot of time to devote to the game that's that's another aspect is like if you're a competitive player you got to be playing this stuff all the time like you don't have time to like look up cards you you got to know uh what what's going on as far as like what this card does you, you can't be like fumbling through your deck you, you have to actually know what cards you need to pull out and what what you need to do and, and that that just takes a, a lot of time and a lot of patience and uh 
I, I think the game is is fun enough and it has enough formats to where you could play at uh, at a, a, a sort of creative fun level that isn't super competitive. They, they call it the meta, the, the most efficient way to play the game. But if you just have a, a, a bunch of cards or maybe you have somebody that has a collection that puts together a couple of decks that would be around the same power level, I, I think the game's a lot of fun and, and you could learn it uh, fairly quickly. The, the games are, are, the rules are complicated, but not overly so. I think you could learn it in, in a relatively short time. You could sort of play around in that sandbox uh, of, of just kind of having some fun with it, uh, testing the waters a bit there. Uh, move, moving sort of away from the playing aspect uh, real quick. Uh, you mentioned some certain cards are like where the money's at. Uh, in, in terms of collecting for the cards, for people collecting, what, what are some of the holy grails? What, what are some of the like super uh, rare stuff that's the most desirable? Uh, for the collectors to get a hold of so there, there's some holographic cards in the reflections three set the later sets uh starting with tatooine so tatooine coruscant and and Thebe palace have alternate art cards so basically those are those are rare cards that have an alternate image from the films and uh those for for example, uh, Padme, that, that card, the alternate image, is, is very expensive. There's also some, some tournament foils. So these were promotional cards given away at either some of the tournaments or some of the game stores uh, gotcha. for players. So uh, a hollow Imperial-class Star Destroyer is probably one of the most expensive gar- cards in the game. Very few of them are around because there is a much l- lesser print run for those. The Corellian Corvette for the light side. I mean that that's very expensive as well. Um, Darth Maul with lightsaber, Qui Gon with lightsaber. Uh, the hollow versions of those are, are very expensive. So, pretty much the AIs and any like promotional cards that have a lower print run. Uh, there's also a few test cards for they they call it Reflections Gold, and that set was never released. But there were a couple of test cards printed for that. And there's a YouTube channel, uh, Andy Talaga runs, where he goes through his collection. He's a, he's a competitive player. He does some videos that tell about the uh, tell you about the game and how to play, how cards work, things like that. But he's also a big collector, and he has some sealed product. He has some reflections, gold cards. He's he's his collection is the most impressive I've I've seen so far. Uh, you, you've mentioned a couple, uh, YouTube channels throughout, uh, so far, uh, if, if you were to point to some good YouTube channels for anyone watching who might be interested in learning more about, uh, the decipher cards or any of the cards, uh, what, what which YouTube channels would you point to as, uh, the best places to go? There, there's a channel called board Matt, and then it's the dice emoji. It's not Matt Wilkins. Matt Wilkins is interested in board games, but this is board Matt and he does videos on a lot of the decipher games. He, he does um, some interviews with some of the designers, which are very worthwhile. Uh, if you, if you just search star Wars CCG, you know, deck video or something like that, you can get some hits of a lot of people that have come up with, with deck ideas and they tell you how to play the deck and, and some of the cards that are important to gameplay and things like that. Uh, so board Matt, dice emoji there, there's a um another guy called fatty f-a-t-t-y uh he does some absolutely hilarious videos a lot of good content he does some giveaways too for some product he, he's just very passionate about the game i would urge people to to check out his channel and uh andy talaga the, the, those are the big three i would i would think okay uh well we'll have those linked in the description uh below uh and uh, if you're interested, go uh, go over and uh, check check those out. Um, in terms of uh, how valuable, uh, from a collecting standpoint, uh, some of these sets stayed. Uh, the from what I've seen, like tops trading cards, pretty dirt cheap. Uh, you can you can get them for like two three dollars and free shipping. You know, uh, it, it would be more expensive to buy like a binder. Or, or a case to display them then get like eight or nine cards. Um, then how does that stack to the Decipher uh, Star Wars card game? And then 
Wizards of the Coast, you said, did have some value there. Uh, and then Fantasy Flight, uh, d- did they stay valuable or you said uh, they didn't sell as well? So uh, h- how do they all stack up in terms of like value? So Fantasy Flight, I don't think is old enough to have any value. Um, sealed product for Wizards of the Coast. I bought some Phantom Menace packs a couple years ago, $15. I thought I thought it was a tremendous deal at $15 a pack. And I bought like 10 packs trying to get some some cards. I wanted a Quinlan Voss card because uh, there's some expanded universe stuff. There's Dark Woman. There's Dirge. There's some stuff. Nice. Uh, that's, that's, awesome. that's really nice from the episode one set. And it, at that point, the single price, the, the price for singles of those cards were high enough to where I think you could, if $15 a pack, I'll open it and take my chances and, and maybe, maybe get some of that money back. Um, that, you know, that at this point is 20 years old. So uh, I think that's old enough to, to have some value and, and, and certain singles, not everything. Like you said, in terms of tops cards, the bulk singles uncommons doesn't have any value and i think that's the same for a lot of these trading card games um but but there's certain rares there's certain holographics there's certain limited print run alternate art that's that's where the money is and i think the same is true for tops is you know you could get now i think they have like uh, one of five, two of five, five of yeah. yeah. There, there, there's certain very limited cards that you can only get in like hobby boxes that are autographed or, or original sketch art. That's where the money is, and, and people pay a lot of money. There's a lot of collectors for for top trading cards, and I don't really understand it because sometimes uh, a certain colored parallel, like you you mentioned, some of the cards were purple versus a different color. Well. To my knowledge, those correspond to the the number of cards printed for that set. So there's a, there's a certain number well, of red cards. There's a lesser number of green cards or purple cards, and it's the I think same there's image. Blue and yellow too that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, and uh, it's the same image. It just has a different border, and that that corresponds to how many were printed. Um, okay, interesting. I, I I don't know if I buy into the hype. I'm not going to pay you know more than twenty dollars for any trading card. I, I don't think for for just a, a trading card that isn't part of a game. But uh, yeah. there are people that that are. So you know, everybody has a preference. Now, for displaying cards and stuff like that, uh, you know, obviously binder is the chosen method for a lot of people. Uh, I've also seen like on Amazon and stuff like that, you could get like frames, uh, so you could like uh, frame some. Uh, would you recommend that? Because I've, I've long thought about getting like a, a frame, you know, that has like, uh, you know, 20 slots. Uh, you can put some of those tops trading cards into it. Uh, nice art, you know, have it on the wall. What yeah. I, I, I would avoid a three ring binder because the binder, depending upon how many cards you have in the binder can press up against the card and cause some damage. So if you gotcha. get a binder, I would get something like this. Okay. That's, um, softer that, padded yeah it doesn't have any rings it, it's just bound like a book and uh has pages I, I would definitely sleeve your cards or double sleeve your cards um but this is a good way to collect it and this zips up so it can avoid humidity and things like that um as far as sealed product i mean the sealed product is normally wrapped in plastic so it's okay on its own um there's some stuff like uh this is an official tournament sealed deck oh wow there's some uh, some things <clears throat> just want to point out here. There's different um, card boxes that, that are official card boxes from the game. And uh, they come in different colors. You get a rules box. And if you have packs, you, you can you can frame packs, but you can also just keep them in the box here. So, um, you know, it, so, some people try to collect one pack of every set. And I think that really looks good, e- either framed or just put it in one of the official boxes um fantasy flight games came out with some sleeves as well there, so there's some mm. official artwork sleeves that expanded universe fans could recognize from yeah. the x-wing games mm-hmm. um this one's from shadows of mendor nice those are cool uh and then there's some just generic ones of characters from the films uh, mm. but yeah you you can kind of go crazy as far as how you want to keep your collection i would i would definitely 
keep single card sleeved and, and in a in a binder but uh you, you could frame things and then sealed product uh you could either frame or or just keep it in its original plastic cool uh now unsealed versus uh sealed like um obviously with cards uh, certain cards are going to be rare so it could be uh if, if you have them in a pack you don't know if you're going to have it but it could be more valuable than the pack sealed right uh so if you open it you could end up uh having something that is a net positive or you could end up opening it and losing uh some money so like that's the risk with with, with action figures i can understand like um keeping some sealed bad camera work but like uh keeping some sealed because there's uh you can you can see what's inside uh but then with the cards uh you're never gonna know what's in there you you, you might know what wave could be in there but you're not going to know exactly uh, the precise stuff that's in there is, is that a constant temptation like oh what if i just open this uh back and forth like i imagine that would be just a battle in your mind yeah i i mean cards you're, you're you're basically throwing your money away opening packs I, I would say even contemporary packs you're you're losing your money you're never gonna it's a, it's a very rare occurrence you're gonna gain your money back more likely than not you're gonna lose money opening any sealed product uh definitely that's definitely the case with older product so for example um you know, if I open this this Dagaba pack here, uh, maybe I can pull one of the bounty hunters. Maybe I can pull a Yoda or a Son of Skywalker, the the Luke card from Dagaba. But I, I'm not going to make my money back, even if I get an executor. Like, there's no card in here that would ever uh, be more expensive than the price of the card or price of the pack sealed. So, you know, you you don't want to hold this stuff forever obviously uh you, you want to open it at some point and and they're meant to be enjoyed there's enjoyment from opening the packs uh yeah. but from a collector's standpoint you definitely want to keep the stuff sealed so i i hope that makes sense but there's some cheaper stuff like this uh this clone wars adventures game a, a booster box is maybe 40 50 bucks so so you can open these and just have fun with them i mean it's it's not going to break the bank so if you want to open product, I would suggest buying some cheaper stuff and just opening that. I wouldn't open a Reflections 3-pack. I wouldn't open a Reflections 2-pack, although there are videos on YouTube of that. They're, they're just setting fire to money at that point. Gotcha. Uh, so um, is there like a, with opening, is there like a sense of risk almost, a sense of gam? Like, you know, some people get a thrill out of gambling. You know, what if I get something... Uh, it's going to make me money overall. Is there like a sense of risk, excitement, et cetera, with opening this kind of stuff? I'm not as familiar with the grading aspect, but if you open a pack, you should get a mint card. You don't always do it. But if you're opening the card uh, specifically for the purpose of sending it out to grade immediately, there are some people that do that. I still don't think you're going to make your money back. But yeah some people try i guess and you're not going to have any fun if you just keep the thing sealed your entire life so yeah my my philosophy is i'm going to probably open everything at, at some point so uh you know it, it's it, it's no fun if you just leave it sealed the rest of your life that's that's what i'm saying yeah gotcha super super cool uh i i have uh i don't have any cards really but uh I, I have something that's kind of silly uh, that I found recently that is a card, but it's a, uh, you might know of this. It's a Frito Lays card uh, that promoted episode one. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. I remember this. Yeah. They, they were like in, were they in the packet itself? Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were in plastic, but like okay, okay, open okay. a bag of chips or something. I remember that I was like in fourth or fifth grade or something at that point. There was a, this was a lead up to episode one and yeah. uh you, you could open a bag of chips and uh you, you'd get similar to like stuff in cereal boxes right you you'd get something wrapped in plastic and uh you get a trading card or something there, there was a, a wado i remember there was a jar jar binks there was a qui-gon there was an obi-wan there was an anakin and that was just part of that media rush leading up to episode one yeah that's super super cool that they did that um for phantom uh, I, I just looked for it on my shelf and I remember that I had it 
in a room upstairs. So <laughs> I I won't show the only card that I have of any kind. Uh, and it, it, it it's it's kind of a funny little thing. It's like really misshapen looking uh, and really greasy looking too. Like the person who opened it up was like still had salt on their fingers, <laughs> like from the chips. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, in whatever way I got it, it was used as a bookmark in a uh, in a hardcover I bought for a uh, courtship of Princess Leia. Someone had used it as a bookmark. It was halfway through. It's a little Palpatine Frito Lay uh, card from Phantom. I seem to remember they weren't just cards. They had like a plastic, almost like a frame or, or something okay. that that was actually uh, engraved to to like match the character. It had the character's name or something like that. I, I'm vaguely remembering something like that, but. Uh, yeah, those those were cool. I, I I remember everything leading up to episode one. That was one of the big things. All the big promotion around it and stuff like that. I'm like you like you said earlier, which was interesting. They named all those obscure characters, so they hadn't left anything for like the cipher to name because they they were gonna market every last little drop out of it, right? Yeah, I I think there's one character that was named from episode one, and it's like, is it the taxi driver on Coruscant or something like that? It's <laughs> some weird aspect. <laughs> gotcha, yeah. and, and I guess I guess Quinlan Voss as well was like taken as a background person that like John Ostrander uh, named with Jander Sema, but like yeah, the majority of it was was for marketing reasons, and it it was a huge push. From everything I've heard about it, a uh, huge mania, huge craze. Just seems so so cool that it was just everywhere. I, I imagine that would have been really really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's so funny hearing some of the game designers talk about some of the lore. They they talk about like General Veers, for example. Well, he appears in the films, but he has some. I guess you would call EU story that happens after it, they, they say his his atat -AT gets destroyed and he's confined to a, a hover wheelchair you know for the rest of his life it's like that's horrible <laughs> why, would you, why would you think that up and, and sometimes they, they really get a kick out of some of that it's just it's more of a joke than anything else yeah and, and it was still entered into you know uh into the database so it, it counted which is just right and, and he really shows up at and what uh, Dark Empire or something is Captain Veers or yeah I, yeah I yeah yeah something. yeah exactly that it, it it's really really cool it's really really cool uh, are, are there any other aspects of cards uh, that you feel uh, ha we haven't covered yet that you'd like to talk about? There, there's so much that can be said about this, and I, I'm probably doing a bad job of of covering everything. It, it's just it's literally impossible to cover everything about that. There's so many angles to collecting, to playing, and, uh, and grading, and the state of the market, uh, and all all this stuff. Um, it's impossible to to create a video of all of that. Uh, but what I can do is we we can open a couple packs if you want. Uh, let's let, let's crack open this uh, Clone Wars Adventures pack. See what we got here. I don't know what you can get here. Uh, I guess it's all Clone Wars cards, but uh, let's see who we got. So we got uh, the Commander Rules here, Card Commander Rules. Starting out with uh, Commander Cody, Padme, Palpatine. Oh, Ahsoka. <laughs> oh, Echo. Echo, all right. That's cool. Sidious. I think there's a hollow in every pack. Looks like one of the pirates. Is that Sahana Lama? It is. It is. I, I thought there's supposed to be a hollow in every pack, but I guess not. Uh, that... Oh, oh, look at this. Ahsoka's the hollow. Isn't that unfortunate? <laughs> uh, I, I was half expecting there to be a Dave Filoni card in there with this cowboy hat. Hey, you, you never know. You never know. That would be hilarious. Let's try <laughs> one, of, one of the decipher... Uh, card packs I, I got plenty of dagobah here so i don't feel bad opening that so let's see what we got you said that uh it could be like something like yoda or uh so yoda son of skywalker is the luke card um there's executor the superstar destroyer there's the bounty hunter all the bounty hunter weapons all the bounty hunter ships but there's not too many light side cards in the set or light side characters 
so we got one of the Jedi trials there, Jedi Test One, Great Warrior. This is Vine Snake. Quick draw. Commander Nemet. I think he's in one of those uh, from a certain point of view short stories. Mm. And they kept his name and everything. Yeah, it's he funny. Um, there, there's some expanded universe writers that contributed to the short story. Patricia Jackson, I think, wrote one of them. Uh, Sean Williams was another one. Um, we got Yoda's Gimmer Stick. That's our rare. So not a great one. But uh, I guess if you're playing a Jedi training deck with Yoda, and that's usually played with Daughter of Skywalker rather than Luke mm -hmm. because you, you kind of want Luke for other things. And there's the so Daughter of Skywalker is Leia, is a Leia, card. yes, yes. And that, that's the way Jedi training is typically played because there's some dark side objectives that take Luke off the table, like bring him before me. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do that when you have Luke training to be a Jedi. Gotcha. So. Thank you for doing uh, some openings of two of those packs, they're very exciting and very cool. Yeah, yeah, glad I could do it, and uh, hope people enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, th this 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 world of cards is very fascinating. It's something that I would really like to get into eventually, but then I feel like I kind of first have to polish off my collection in a way that I'm happy with, like uh, you know, kind of the main expanding universe stuff, and then I'd like to uh, delve into like collecting the RPG source books and stuff like that. And then I feel like then I can go to like promo posters and more foreign copies because I really like like a like a, this is um a French copy of I Jedi uh, the mm -hmm. Legacy of Corin Horn because they divided it into uh, you know two volumes I, I like getting some of the foreign uh, printings and stuff like that and then like uh, when I'm doing the foreign printings the posters I feel like then I'll have like the time and the ability to commit the resources to the cards. Cause it seems like it's a pretty big undertaking. It is. It is. And there's always something you forget about. There's always something more to collect that somebody has. People are, it, it's very dangerous watching YouTube videos on star Wars collectibles <laughs> because you see everything everybody has. And you're like, man, <laughs> you're constantly buying stuff. Cause, cause you, you see it and you're interested in it. Um, but yeah, there, there's just so much and, uh, so much to collect promo materials, just stuff you'd never even heard of. Uh, there, there's one point of interest now with the, uh, the fantasy flight, there's many R RPG scenarios that they gave away for like free RPG day and things like that. The mini verse cards. Yeah. Yeah. There's like shadows of black sun. Those have gone down in price specifically. So lately on eBay, I don't know if some people found a, bulk you know collection of them or a warehouse full of them because now they're a lot more affordable than they than they used to be and uh i've been picking up some of those those obscure uh rpg adventures that are like 20 around 2013 or so so they're still they're, they're definitely eu but uh they're, they're hard to find and there, there's not really much to them either there's like a, a quick adventure and they might focus on one character i think the shadows of black sun i was flipping through it it focuses on the pikes um from the clone wars but uh yeah not not too much there those mini verse cards that were given out at rpg events um like shadows of treus academy was one infestation was another uh, there's two others that's titles i'm forgetting sandstorm was one so that just leaves one that i'm forgetting but uh those four i i could have gotten them for like 20 bucks uh, and i didn't uh, and I regret that because then the next day I saw like one of them listed for like 35, just one. And I could have mm -hmm. had all four for 20. So I, I, I'd like to track those down at some point. If you ever see any of those go up again uh, anywhere, let me know. Because those those miniverse cards establish something interesting that you can like take into the lore if you want. It's kind of like, you know, the gray area of like RPG, you know, secondary canon stuff. But uh, it like places Nomi on Terrace and says that Nomi was on Terrace at some point um with the republic which is interesting to say the least uh, that it has that uh, you can take that into lore if you want i guess uh it doesn't seem like it contradicts anything but you know it's, it's kind of fascinating and for that i think they're kind of cool collectibles so are these fan produced or are they no are they we were they were from wizards of the coast i believe they were given out at rpg stores uh they were oh, printed okay. out yeah 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 and they, they had a small circulation, it seems. 
I have scans of them online and stuff like yeah. that. I can send there, you and stuff. There's a lot of Wizards of the Coast stuff that was uh, produced online too. So you'd buy one of the adventures or whatever, but it said, "Oh, there's this e extra stuff online." You know, go and print it out, and you could add add those things. And there's probably some extra lore in there here and there. Uh, and then when hyperspace shut down, of course, uh, you know, all that stuff was seemingly lost. But now it seems like people have brought that stuff back out because it appears all available again. <laughs> I, I don't know why the the timing's certainly curious on, on some of this stuff. It's like where has it been all these years? Because I've been looking for just some to of those resurface. Stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is it re resurfaced now? Like, what, what's the uh, what's the backstory in that? And and who's responsible? Like, we got to get them on and, and talk to them, saying why have you been, you know, withholding yeah. this for for so long? <laughs> just point a finger. Why have you kept this on your hard drive without sharing it with us? <laughs> right, right. What, why, why release it now, too? That's, yeah, yeah. That's another thing. It's interesting. Uh, I on Wikipedia, uh, browsing through that, I've I've seen stuff like related to fantasy flight games where it says it's part of like a digital fantasy flight games card game, and there is a ton of lore with that stuff. There's like a whole character. He's like a Sith Inquisitor. I forget his name, but he's like there's a lot of information about him, and there's like a lot of Jedi in this storyline and stuff like that. And that's all from car. And there's a lot of art for it, like really good art. But and so I was thinking, is that from one of the source books? But it was from like a digital card game that they did, and it had a ton of lore. Uh, are, are those are those digital cards like lost, or uh, can they still be found? I, I don't know. Those are uh, like like those. Uh games for the mobile phone that were you know you played on your razor yeah. phone some of that stuff is is kind of lost i don't know how you would ever recover those because the the uh systems that run those those games including like the virtual card games i don't know how you would ever recreate those um yeah i guess somebody more familiar with computers maybe be, be able to tell you but uh as far as i know i don't know there there's any way to get that like the only information we have on it basically is having to take the Wook's word for it that uh, all of this information is actually from that because like they cite their sources this and you can't access it. So it's like, uh, I hope they're not lying as the Wook tends to do, you know? Yeah, that, that that's a big uh, problem I have with Wikipedia is you click on the links, you know, some of them work and then some of them take a, a weird position, like some of the stuff that was made in 2014 and it references expanded universe stuff like build the millennium falcon like how do you know if that's canon or not yeah there's, there's really no official position it's just kind of what you what you think yet wikipedia has to take a official position on these things and uh i, I think a reasonable person could disagree on some of that i've been working on a script uh for a video uh based around fantasy flight game source books and like saying what's canon what's legends uh and what's kind of in between i'm sure you'll have many thoughts uh based on it because i don't I'm, I'm not that experienced with it so i'm just like going through the book and then finding scans of it online and then like reading through the source books myself so it's taking a while to make the video but like uh i it just seems very subjective overall uh yeah like with in regards to some of it because like some of it won't reference canon but it like won't reference the EU. So then it's like, well, where do I go on that? Like uh, as a maximalist, I'm like a expanding universe maximalist. I want, I'm greedy. I want as much content for the EU as possible. So like, I'd be uh, more like uh, erring on the side of, yeah, let's bring it in. But then it's like, there's nothing that says it is or isn't. So it's just a really weird place with a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I, I generally would, think that you could include it if it's officially licensed yeah uh, it's a different sort of thing with fan produced things but uh a, a lot of the, all you have is some fan that may have some material from that game or that uh thing that runs on an old program and say okay yeah this is official because it was part of this uh, official project it was on this website it was part of this mobile game but they don't have all of it so they could pick and choose what to use and what not to be. And you can never tell if Wikipedia is complete either, but some of these games aren't that old. And the people that worked on these games have, have to still be around in some yeah. form or fashion. And uh, like, for example, like when wizards of the coast had the license, 
they had basically all their employees contribute to Star Wars in some form or fashion. That's There's, why we have like some source books where no one knows who wrote that. Like, uh, like, uh, well, who, who was just talking about this? Matt was talking about it on a more civilized age. He, he was saying like, uh, that with, with, with fantasy flight and wizards of the coast, you had source books where that every intern got to like add something in there. So there's like not writing credits. So like, it's like, well, there could be like a berry or like a fruit that's like included in the source material and no one knows where that came from. It just like ended up in the final product. Right. Or there's a list of several people that all contributed to it. And yeah. who, who knows who wrote what part of it, right? That That's hard yeah. to tell. But the thing is, a lot of these people are still giving interviews and they would probably be able to remember some of that if, if they were asked. And uh, that's why I'm trying to be as, as uh, have my eyes peeled on all these RPG groups, because sometimes they'll get uh, an official interview with, with one of these uh, former game designers and they're able to answer your questions. And, and uh, the, the problem is you have to be familiar with the material and, you know, I'm not as familiar with everything off the top of my head. I have to kind of go back and, and read some of it. But as far as like who from the company contributed to what material, I mean, there was, there was things from wizards of the coast where, there's this guy that uh, did these uh, Pokemon trading card game books from like the fossil set, and the jungle set, those, those early sets and, and how to play the game and stuff. And he was a Wizards of the Coast employee because that company made that card game. Uh, but he also wrote some expanded universe short stories, like like some vignettes and, and small adventures and stuff like that. Like so, on the online stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, on the and, website. And he's always going to get credit for that. You know, he's going to be an expanded universe author, really, because they had the official license at that point. And it's it's just fun to go back and, and hear the stories of things like that. Um, I know at Decipher, they got early access to episode one and they went to Skywalker Ranch, just like a lot of the authors so and cool. the uh, and the RPG uh, people and it they rented out an entire theater and saw episode one <laughs> and you hear their candid reactions to some of this stuff. It's like, yeah, man, everybody hated that movie. <laughs> they walked out just like scratching their head. Like, how are we going to make a game around this stuff? This isn't going to be <laughs> taking, taken well by the public. It's just, it's so funny to hear. They, they didn't say that at the time, obviously, but now that it, years have now passed, times they, have passed. Yeah. yeah they, they can go and, and say that now and not get in trouble. Who knows? Maybe, <laughs> 10 20 years now the stories we'll hear about the new canon and, and what happened behind the scenes particularly when they changed over the decisions made to go from the expanded universe to end that and go to the new canon i i just i can't wait to hear that i, I hope there's people... gonna be some juicy stuff coming out about all of that yes yes that, that'll Tim be amazing timothy's man. on timothy's on when he doesn't have to worry about his contract with like the current lucasfilm like we th there's that old interview of him before the decanonization where he's like retooling the continuity would be disastrous. Dis it would, dis it would be destructive, you know, and, and he was right. Uh, but he, he, he's maintained, you know, kind of a, you know, you know, they're paying me. So I'm, I'm writing my new stories. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not publicly bitter about anything. I think, I think in a couple of years, yeah, you're <laughs> we're just gonna hear all the retires. Stuff out. Yeah, yeah, just wait, wait till he no longer needs to support himself or make a living or something. He'll he'll be more open, just like just like Tom Veach was with like when he saw the films, he's like, They're they're taking my idea, you know. It it was yeah. so funny to see his his Facebook post uh of like, oh my gosh, they're taking this and this, and it was just a, a the, the realization of, of what had come to pass with that film <laughs> it, it was just oh my gosh. And then uh, L. Neil Smith came out and said some really great stuff as well. Because, uh, you know, he doesn't have to worry about a job anymore either. He, he had some great things to say as well. Uh, <laughs> with with some kind of scathing criticisms and critiques. Um, yeah, yeah. it's We're going to hear some stuff come out, I think. Yeah. It, it, it just one other uh, thing kind of related to that switchover. Uh, I was a former listener of the uh, the Jedi Journal's podcast. So that was the Star Wars Literature podcast on the force.net. And that had gone for years. I think it started around 2010. And they, they ended their final episode a few years ago in 2021. And there was so much insight 
at, at for that final episode. I, I had sort of dropped off listening after 2014 where they didn't really cover the expanded universe anymore. They had switched over to new canon. But for that final episode, about 20 minutes into that final podcast, it, it's definitely worth a listen because they talk about how they used to interview all these authors, Aaron Alston, and, and some mm -hmm. of these people that had passed. Um, who was the guy that worked on the the making of Return of the Jedi that passed? I forget the guy's name. Darn. Uh, but but they, they talk about some of these interviews where... Uh, they had open access to these authors back in the day, back when the expanded universe was going on. And then as soon as Disney bought the company, they were shut down. They had to put their questions in advance to be pre-approved. And they, they just couldn't conduct interviews like they used to do and talk about the things that they used to do. Everything had to be, uh, you know, under a microscope and pre-approved and, the authors were hesitant to say certain things about how they were hired and, and the terms, you know, the contract, or is there anything, you know, in the works for a sequel to this book? Like they couldn't answer those sorts of questions. And that was, that was really insightful to, to hear that uh, from, from Chris Wyman, one of the, one of the co-hosts of that show. Yeah. Well, we've, we've talked about a lot of different topics uh, so far. We've, we, we, we've been talking about, the cards it's been great thank you so much for your insights uh kind of a you were kind of a a a, a window into that world a little bit uh, especially for me because i know nothing about uh the cards i feel like i know a little bit more about it uh now uh thanks to uh some of your knowledge here so thank you very much for sharing it uh we'll have to have you back on the channel sometime to to do a more general how you got into the star wars type of video uh but thank you so much for spending your time today um talking about uh, all of these cards all of this uh, uh deep knowledge really appreciate you uh sharing it with us yeah my pleasure great to be on oh and is there anything you'd like to promote uh with your channel uh maybe a maybe an admiral uh akbar and winter uh fan fiction video at some point in the future uh, i can't make any promises but I, I would like to show off one final thing if you have some time absolutely So I don't know how well this is going to show off on camera, but everybody knows I like book displays. Um, yeah. I got this book display. I'll show this part first, actually. That would make more sense. This is the Young Jedi Knights display. No way. You know, everybody's yes. Fam everybody's familiar with this, right? Uh, Jason, Jaina, Lubaka. Uh, that's no pretty logo. common. That's pretty common. But there's another aspect to this book display that has some original artwork. I don't know if Chris has shown this off or not, but I was able to get this TIE fighter. No way. The the downed, with, the yeah. downed fighter in yeah. Young Jedi Knights. Yes, with, with the character art, it's pretty dark. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the TIE pilot there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I see it yeah. now. I see and, him. And I, I can't find that artwork anywhere else. As far as I could tell, that's original artwork. To the display. That's a yeah. artwork for that character. Official artwork for that character that's only on that display. Right. And, and why isn't that? I mean, that's a pretty, you know, somebody spent a lot of time with that drawing. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's dark. I don't know how well it shows up on camera, but there's a lot of vines and like Yavin 4 stuff. There's, there's the TIE fighter and the TIE fighter pilot. I've never seen that artwork anywhere else. So as far as I know, that's original artwork. I could be proven wrong, but that's so cool. Like, why, why would they create that just for that uh, book display yeah. and then not show it anywhere else? Blows my mind. That's wild. That's wild. Thank you so much for showing that. That is so, so, so super cool. Uh, what, what, how, how did, how did you uh, acquire that? Oh, I, I can't say I can't uh, really, <laughs> if I told my methods, uh, everybody would be after, after state, those, uh, state yeah. secrets, state, yeah, secrets. State, state secrets. Exactly. Okay. Well, uh, th thank you for your time uh, today, and thanks for showing that. That's so super cool. And thank you to everyone for watching. Uh, if you have any card-related comments, um, leave them in the comments section directed to Scott. <laughs> I can I can uh, send him screenshots over so that he can uh, uh, respond. And, if yeah, 
and if anyone's interested in playing the game, you know, at, at an amateur, you know, casual level, let me know because uh, I'll uh, I'll be willing to play a couple of games online on the on the GIMP platform, uh, test out a couple decks, you know, maybe show you how the game works. I, I'm I'm sort of familiar with the game, you know, I played as a kid, but I probably didn't play by the rules, <laughs> and you know, I can follow some of the technical aspects of like deck creation and stuff, but I I am an amateur player for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, make make sure to let Scott know if you'd like to uh, if you'd like to go for that uh, that card game experience. Sounds awesome. Uh, and with that said, uh, we'll see you guys next time.